Welcome to Popcorn Psychology, the podcast where we watch blockbuster movies and psychoanalyze them. My name is Brittany Brownfield, and I'm a child therapist, and I'm joined by... Ben Stover, individual therapist. Hannah Espinoza, marriage and family therapist. We are all licensed clinical professional counselors, also known as therapists who practice out of Chicago. Even though we are licensed mental health professionals, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes and to fulfill our love of dissecting pop culture in all forms. Please remember that even though we are all licensed therapists, we aren't your therapist. If you are struggling with mental health symptoms, please find a local mental health provider. Hi, happy Pride. Um, before we begin, we just wanted to remind everybody um, that we have a lot going on. We have a Patreon if you want to become a patron of Popcorn Psychology. If you um, are a patron for $50, you can pick an episode that we talk about. So don't forget about that. Also, if you could rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, we do read them. We take them very personally. <laughs> just joking but we always love to read your reviews if you could throw some at us we'd really appreciate it you can also find us at um, instagram facebook and um at popcorn psychology twitter at popcorn popcorn underscore psych and we also have a tiktok at popcorn psychology if you want to give us some love over there we're still figuring it out but i think we're getting there i think we're getting there and by us i mean me because i'm the one mm-hmm. who's trying Mm -hmm. to do that so like i said this is our second pride episode today we will be talking about tu wong fu thanks for everything julie newmar and who is julie newmar ben catwoman exactly i have to skip that right out of the way so she played the catwoman in the tv show right correct in the tv show and was responsible for the sexual awakening of an entire generation of men and probably some women Great. <laughs> so <laughs> in Tuong Fu, um, it is about three drag drag queens played by Patrick Swayze, Wesley Snipes, and John Leguizamo. Their names are Brittany, Vita. We don't talk about Bruno. Oh I'm my sorry, god. <laughs> Classic dad move. Um, they are playing Vita, Noxima, and Chi Chi, and they are three drag queens who are traveling across country via car to get to the drag, like Miss America drag queen contest in Hollywood, California, from New York. So during this, you know, trip and adventure, their car breaks down in a small, 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 small town. Seems like it's about a block long and a block wide. Um, of America where they have to intermingle. It's a classic shenanigans 90s movie where these big city drag queens have to mingle with these uh, how do they put it? Roughnecks? (laughs) Basically small town America people and they blend together and form community. So speaking of community, we're going to be talking about community um, and specifically found families and the macro community with the town. We'll also be talking about domestic and intimate partner violence. And as always, we'll be hitting upon treatment and final thoughts. So when we're talking about found found family in this movie, specifically, we are talking about Vita, Noxima, and Chi Chi. And how they have a... It's kind of um, what we were talking about before we started recording was that Vida is very much like the mother figure. And then we have, and like sister too, it's kind of a mix of both. And then how we kind of see Nagzima and Chi Chi have more of like a sibling-esque relationship in the film, um, which is, which I think is something that is a, a part of the queer community, LGBTQ plus community is sometimes when uh, people's families don't accept them in one way or another, we, they have found families and that the way that this is talked about is in regards to um, drag queens as well as, and just the whole, so like if you've watched Pose, there's a lot of really good information or kind of a lot of good has a lot of good information to kind of give you a better sense of what the community looks like. And so when we see the three of these, um, when we see these three characters, that's kind of how they end up interacting. And that's kind of what we experience. But there's also some like some arguing and some frustration and some kind of had, um, uh kind of like arguments that come up that I think are pretty natural to families just kind of in general, but that a part of what is also kind of beautiful about this is that they also work together like a family and are kind of trying Mm -hmm. to teach and hold each other accountable in different ways uh, throughout the film. 
Yeah, like Vida is definitely the mother figure. Um, she is the one in the movie that takes the most kind of authoritative role. And also like her and Noxima seem to have, like you're saying, she does make a mention in the beginning of the movie how she took Noxima under her wing and definitely taught her how to put on makeup and things like that. Because at the beginning of the movie, it's just the two of them. And then Vita kind of drives the ship of like, we should take Chi-Chi under our wing as well. Chi-Chi's clearly struggling in one way or another. And so we should take them on her under our wing as well to go on this trip. And Noxima, which I think is classic only child energy, <laughs> is like, no, I don't understand why we're doing that. And Vita has to put her foot down and is like, we did this for you. This is what we do. We pass along. And like you were saying, Hannah, we're I'm not a part of obviously the drag community or the queer community other than an ally. And I would say another good. So reference source, if you're also not familiar with the community, is Paris is Burning is a good documentary about the ballroom scene and more of like the trans and queer scene. And it talks a lot about how there is this understanding that you have your mother that you were born to, and then you have the sort of the mother that takes you under your her wing in the community. And that's kind of an understood family structure. And I don't know if this movie is meant to demonstrate that or if that's just kind of the structure in which the narrative that the movie allows its story to go through but it mm -hmm. made me think of that and Chi Chi definitely acts like the baby of the family um, definitely. Like, and <laughs> yeah and the newcomer yes she's I mean god love her I mean I hold a lot of affection and she is difficult like she is a lot moodier than the other two she is like in the movie kind of opens with her being really upset and she doesn't need a lot of direction and like you're saying hannah though vita holds this more they both kind of parent chi chi in a lot of ways mm -hmm. more specifically like watching it as a child therapist um when they were basically making her earn princess points <laughs> as a way to keep her in line it was very much like a reward system you'd give no offense to chi chi a child of like if you behave you can you know get these imaginary points that they literally other than like getting promoted to drag queen have no like tangible meaning she's really swayed by them as well which also made me laugh how much she is motivated by losing and earning princess points she they definitely <laughs> snapped in line like a kid with a go chart like a, yes. a behavior chart like oh i can get to get a treat out of the treasure chest, then I can go potty when I'm supposed to. I can brush my teeth without incident. Yes, and look at my little car. It moves on the thing, and then I get something out of the box. Yeah, it was exactly like that. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it does make me curious. We don't really... We don't really see any of their... We don't really know any of their backstory prior to the opening of the movie, like their family histories other than Vita. Um, and what we see with Vita is that they pass her home that she grew up in and her mother comes outside and I think recognizes her and then quickly goes inside. And so I think also what is, you know, vital about a fan, found family within these communities, like you were saying, Hannah, is typically there is rejection within their family of origin, as we say in therapy. And um, Vita even says, like, I had to, oh, what's the quote? Vita gave all this up to be Vita because Chi Chi was like saying, like, you were clearly rich. You grew up rich. How could you give all this up? Like, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you like take it? And she was like, I had to give it all up to be myself. And, and I think we don't know a lot about, we don't know anything really about Noxima's family of origin. Mm -mm. And I think based just on observing Chi Chi, I have, I can make a lot of assumptions based on observing Chi Chi, like the way she eats food, like this might seem really like, like I'm drilling in on something specific, but there's a scene where she's at the pool in like the beginning and she's eating food, like really, it looks sloppy, like to be quite honest, but she's holding a fork as if no one taught her how to hold a fork. And so I think these little moments of Chi Chi's behavior, I think indicate to me like someone who was not raised properly or maybe had been neglected. I think also kind of the push pull she has with the girls, the older two sort of indicates to me as well, someone who might have attachment issues or sort of like abandonment. Like you were 
you kind of said, Ben, like she snaps in place, like this very, like I push you away. Like she's so eager to be with them and so eager to be part of their group. And then as soon as there's resistance, she'll like run away from them too. And reminds them constantly that she could leave them at the drop of a hat. Yeah. It seems like she needs a lot of, she does a lot of testing in the movie about their Mm -hmm. attachment to her. She does. She does a lot of testing. She does a lot of um, being open and then closed to feedback and then does a lot of auditioning behaviors where she tries on feedback for size and sees how it feels and struggles with limiting herself or responding to the advice of the older siblings, if you will, of, hey, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Whatever fantasy you think this is going to be, it's not going to go that way. And Mm -hmm. that really showed up later in the film when the Bobby, it wasn't Bobby Ray, because that's the girl. Bobby Bobby Lee. Lee No, Bobby Ray. Bobby Ray is the boy. Bobby Lee is the girl. Yeah, you were right. (laughs) Yeah, when Bobby Bobby Ray is really into her, but, you know, uh, they don't know that, you know, he's a, she's a drag queen. That's, Mm -hmm. you know, as they remind her over and over that, you know, underneath that, there's still a he. And, Bobby Ray does not know that. Mm-hmm. That you guys, what are you going to do? And they do the thing where they point fingertips at each other. And like, what What do you think he's going to think when that happens? Like, that's when violence happens. And yeah. watching her struggle with kind of the fantasy about what it feels like to have someone recognize and be into them. And then what that would be like in reality, which the older two obviously know and have lived through as they caution against it the entire time. Like, that's how people get killed. Yeah. Chi Chi takes a lot of risks during the movie. Maybe you guys can let me know what you think, but Chi Chi takes a lot of risks during the movie that to me don't quite make sense for someone who I assume has been having to take care of themselves for a while. And I don't know Mm -hmm. if it's like just self-destructive or something I'm not quite understanding because I'm not part of the community, you know, intimately. Um, But and Chi Chi does make mention of things like in the beginning of the movie, like I want like real love, like someone to really think I'm special, not these men that like sweat over me and that kind mm. of thing. Like they do make mention of pretty not good relationships, if that's even what they were. And so, and she, and like she knows she, how to hit. She'd been in, it sounded like she that she'd been in the sex work community or had yeah. at least been in the um, lifestyle of kind of taking whatever she could get when people threw attention at her because she has really significant problems with self-esteem and identity and Mm -hmm. wanted love and Mm -hmm. was really confused about what that even meant. And that's really clear in the subtext of her character that she doesn't seem to understand what love means and has this very fairy tale understanding of it. Yeah. And I think, I mean, this movie happens crazy fast and like everyone has these big character arcs in like literal days <laughs> sometimes mm-hmm. hours um so yeah. that part of it's definitely movie magic and i think we do see what probably would have happened over a longer period of time with chi chi which is like slowly realizing that noxima and vita are looking out for her and not trying to hold her back i think like the big big like you mentioned the big fight that they have hannah in the, I don't know if it's like a bed and breakfast they're staying in or like a boarding house kind of situation. I don't know if I would call it a hotel. But it's a hotel. I mean, it's says it's a hotel. Oh, that's true, yeah. yeah. The hotel they're staying in, um, they have that big, big blowout, which kind of boils down to sort of, I think, Chi Chi feeling like she's being held back. It's coming from like a competitive sort of ill-meaning way, which unfortunately triggers Vita because also Chi Chi does that testing thing where she says like the meanest stuff you can Mm -hmm. say to somebody like bringing up Vita's family, which is obviously a very sensitive subject. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then unfortunately Vita takes the bait quickly apologizes, which is very important. The repair work part is very important, but unfortunately, and that's probably is pretty realistic. I think in those situations, it would be when you're taking in someone who is 
like presenting like Chi Chi is presenting, there's probably a good chance you're going to have maybe like a drag out fight at some point that you're probably going to have to do repair work on because she's going to be hard in the sense of she's going to be testing, 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 and hopefully you can keep your shit together when that happens. But we're human beings, so. We are. I think, though, something that I wanted to point out is that in the the sense of fandom gatekeeping that I see, I saw a lot of their parenting behaviors of of Chi Chi is almost gatekeeping and like bordering on like what what felt like making her earn her place into the community, mm-hmm. and that felt like more like setting up some rules and set points that she had to meet in order to not be called a boy in a dress and be recognized as a drag queen that that rubbed me the wrong way as Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like it was from the healthiest because there weren't set standards there weren't things that they pre-established they made them up as they went along and they said you have to earn five with five princess points in order to be there's like four steps to becoming a drag queen four steps to becoming a drag queen, which were yeah. not defined, which did not exist. And they just kind of decided <laughs> arbitrarily like a but carrot if, dangling in front of her face, which they correctly recognized. She needed some structure to her life. But to me, it felt like it, the way it got interpreted was like, you can't be anything but a boy in a dress until you understand mm-hmm. with, without like mentoring or gentleness to it. It came across quite harsh, particularly from Noxima at first. Like Vita was also pretty harsh at first, but then softened. But to me, it felt like the gatekeeping that happens in fandom communities where like for being part of the Star Wars community, I see it a lot where they are just so guilty of it. Like, well, you haven't watched as much Star Wars as me. You don't know about as much as me. So you don't get to talk on the subject until you've done as much research as me or know the characters as well. And <laughs> the way that that is done in... Star Wars community and the D&D community and a couple others, probably Star Trek too, but I'm not a Trekkie, so I don't know. Um, even Lord of the Rings, some of these things that have well-established backstories and back cannons and side chains that some people think your opinion on a subject doesn't matter until you've spent years of your life digging through all of this canon as opposed to just having your own interpretation of the story. And to me, watching them treat her like that kind of rubbed me the wrong way like when you try to get into a fandom you discover something new you want to talk about it with people and then you get kind of shamed and shunned a little bit for asking questions that have already been asked or thoughts that aren't really new but they're new to you because you're just discovering this property you're just discovering this world and you see a lot of that that really bothers me um when i watch the way that they treated her and I know, Brittany, you were telling me gatekeeping is used in different ways in different <laughs> places and that maybe the, uh, you know, uh, Generation Z version of it is different. But <laughs> w- when I think of gatekeeping, I see a lot of them gatekeeping the title of drag queen away from Chi Chi. Kind of like how you're saying it's sort of like holding her at like arm's length from it and not letting her in until she's proved herself. Like that's, it seems like that's the way that you're defining or the way that gatekeeping is defined. That's the way gatekeeping is defined in the worlds that I'm a part of. Okay. Uh, I do, you know, I'm aware that, you know, our, the English language is so fun that we can have 19,000 <laughs> different meanings for one word, whether it's spelled the same and how the inflection is used. But the, the way that I was watching it was like, I feel like they're gatekeeping. They're like saying, no, you can't come in until you do all this work, mm-hmm. which is basically what, some of the fandom communities do like not just the ones I mentioned, but even some of the other, like the superhero communities, Marvel, DC, et cetera. Like some of the online chat boards or friend to friend chats like, Oh, you can, well, you can't even talk until you've seen this. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't even talk until you've seen that one or until you've read this or until you've read that. Well, you watched the movie. Well, that, I mean, you, did you read the book? Because if you didn't read the book, well, that doesn't count. <laughs> Which, the fun. I've phrase- heard that from someone before. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> well, the fun phrase that gets thrown a lot nowadays is gate, gaslight, gatekeep, girl boss. <laughs> That's kind of like the motto that they make fun of people for now, of like, people who are toxic. They're, they use it in a more like ironic way, not in like you should do those three things to people. 
but it's the idea like also girl boss in the way that it is used in a toxic sense um in a similar way that you're talking about which i think happens in a lot of communities which is ironed my way up here like and so you have to earn Mm -hmm. your way too and i think it is a lot of ways like passing down well it's how we all can be quite how do i want to put it like I mean, is there a male version of toxic uh, girl boss? Well, that's just the is way it only they, mostly is it girls only... say that to other girls um, mm-hmm. because that the phrase it's because people use the term girl boss, I think, to justify certain behaviors in a way that's probably not mm. super dissimilar from toxic masculinity. Like I'm just being a girl boss, but really you're being a heinous bitch, perhaps. <laughs> um, and I lost my train of thought. With perhaps that. used lightly. <laughs> perhaps and i think but i think it's one of those things that unfortunately people pass down bad experiences it's sort of like you have to earn your stripes kind of energy which mm-hmm. i could also imagine in if i can kind of make assumptions about the drag community like i'm sure there's a there's a lot of trauma going into that community just because of how people find their way there and the way that people are treated who are queer um in all the different contexts of that and so I could see with the having earned your stripes of like, we had to work really hard to get here. So you have to show that you're part of the group and kind of really earn your way in and show that you mean it. And then kind of like, I don't know, I think a lot of communities do this of like, I'm sure the military do this in some capacity, the like. Yeah, it's, it's called boot camp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, like hazing and frats, like in sororities, just like, you have to show us your stuff and until you can show us your stuff, like you aren't allowed into like the upper echelon or like the secret rooms or like get deserve the titles. Like you have to work towards it, which I think in this specific situation, the movie, you know, I, 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 I get what you're saying, Ben. And I could also see being protective of it. Um, but also I think, probably this is how you feel because it's how I can feel sometimes which is just put your arms open babes and let every, like just everyone just be cool and like oh, like welcoming each other in with like big old arm like big old hugs and kisses yeah that's exactly that's think, the way ben, I feel right? big old hugs and kisses and the Star this Wars is why, community yes, mm-hmm. it, all mean, those neck beards just rubbing up against each other yes. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to slap yourself twice <laughs> But I will tell you that that tendency of me is what makes me a Hufflepuff. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yes, that side yeah. of me is probably why I consistently test for the Hufflepuff side of things as opposed to yeah. the other sides of my personality that don't match that at all. Is that, yes, I do think that people who gatekeeping and um, Hannah, the male word for it, at least that men would say to each other is douchebag um, or douche canoe <laughs> or douche nozzle or douche box. Douche nozzle, the business end of the douche. A- any of that. But like really the... It is exactly the way I feel. And the way a lot of people feel, there's like, it was almost like three three camps of fandom where people are like, yes, bring everybody and let everybody experience their own way. Let's talk to everybody about their own experience and let them have it. And then we'll suggest new stuff for them to, to look at too. There's people who go, well, you'll never know as much as me. So I get to be the king of this domain. And then there's the people who go, mm, talk to me when you've read more. And they kind of gatekeep that way. So when I see this, it reminds me of some of the toxicity in fandom where instead of taking people under their wing and opening their hearts to them, we see a lot of like, no, I don't know, prove it to me. Mm-hmm. And that kind of thing is something that I've always hated, that hazing mentality. And it reminded me a lot of, um, you know, like some of the more toxic male stuff. We see it in Jarhead in particular when they're going to brand Jake Gyllenhaal. They, they they go through that fake branding scene with him where they put a brand on his leg. They like grab him and hold him down and then put a non lit up brand on him and he passes out. Mm-hmm. And bikes on bikes. Yep. Well, at I, least... These kinds of things just, they, they mm-hmm. stick out to me as something that I find bothersome and I did not care for that side of this movie watching them. I was like, I, I think recognizing that this person is emotionally unstable, has gone through a lot and doesn't know who she is, that providing structure could have been done in a different way that 
was outlined with clear definable tasks, was non-threatening, was non-shaming, was non-exclusionary, was saying you can join this community, but you need to do some of these things in order to firm up your identity and not be a boy in a dress, but to be like Noxima so like clearly defined the boundaries between like the different types of people who dress differently. Mm Mm-hmm. By like going through, this is a transsexual, this is a transvestite, this is transgender, and mm-hmm. this is what drag queen means, and kind of working through those things. Mm-hmm. And I thought that that was really an important part of where it started to get clearly defined, but that they were also using it in an exclusionary way instead of an inclusionary way, and I didn't like that. So that that end of mm-hmm. speech, Ron Swanson. <laughs> <laughs> I also probably think it was probably exposition for us straights that were watching the movie in the 90s to were like, well, hold up. What's the difference between a drag queen and somebody who just wears girls clothes for kicks? And they had to like do a little exposition dump in the beginning um, for all the all the yeah regular straights who are watching. Um, but yeah, I think well, I'll go ahead, Hannah. No, you finish. Let's see. I think Noxima, she is harder of the two, but I think like I was saying also. I think she's very protective of her relationship with Vita and basically I think of their standing within the community and really wanting to also test Chi Chi, I think, as a threat to them in some ways, or at least a pain in their ass. Yeah. I was just thinking about just in, in general, in terms of community and a lot of other ways, um, a part of what they do when they go to the town is, I mean, yeah, it's movie magic and blah, 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 but that, but that either way, the idea of being accepted and of having people Mm -hmm. in your community that are diverse, but that also understand how important it is to have other people in your, in your corner and how important mm-hmm. that always is and and how sometimes when it's a town that you know maybe for some people looks like a place you can't imagine i have seen those towns my mm-hmm. some of my siblings have grown up in some of those towns my father grew up in one of those towns um where there's you know two <laughs> One store that has clothes, one store that has this, and maybe a hotel or a motel if you're lucky, but most of the time, not even that. And it's just one kind of main road, but not really, that goes through the town. Um, also known as uh, M46 in uh, Michigan. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so it was really interesting to kind of see that uh, just kind of in general, but also that there's a lot of towns that are like that. And I think that one of the things that I would like to, in terms of community is the way that all of the uh, female presenting um, people in the town kind of really came together to learn more about each other and to explore different parts of themselves and kind of to be vulnerable with each other, which, you know, uh, I don't know if that, I mean, I don't think that would have been possible in 1995, um, but also is kind of beautiful to see and kind of the continuing the realization that having more information is, you know, knowledge is power in terms of understanding, but also in terms of just having people around you who can help remind you of the, of the things, the positive things about you and that what you deserve as a human. And I think that's a part of what, that's a part of what we saw in the community that was shown, not only in terms of the relationships between, um, Vita and Chi Chi and Eczema, but also in the town itself of people kind of learning how to respect each other a little bit more um, and also just be kind to each other. Mm -hmm. I think what the movie is kind of trying to do, and I think in an ideal world, this is what would happen, but movie, 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 magic, 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 is that it seems like the town was kind of waiting for something to come in and sort of like wake them up. Like you were saying, like the town had potential to be like this, but had kind of gotten stale for whatever reason. We don't get a lot of backstory for almost anything in this movie, the town included, other than they used to have a movie theater. So I assume they used to be more, my assumption is it's something like a mining town or, you know, some town that had something going for it. 
that went away and therefore the town kind of died like a ghost town. And now the people living there are the people that couldn't leave. And Mm -hmm. as you're seeing like right away, like the Blythe Danner character starts like gossiping with them. It's like, they've been waiting, like you were saying for more community to kind of open them up and give them the opportunity to be more vulnerable, to be more colorful, to be more even just communal and kind to each other and how sometimes that can happen when we live in bubbles is it's just like sort of a feedback loop. And that is like, you're saying the importance of widening that bubble. We vilify the internet a lot and trust me, it deserves it in a lot of ways. And I think what's been nice about- The internet is dark and full of terrors, Brittany. But I think what also is nice about the internet, if we're going to think of it in a willfully optimistic way, which I can do with a lot of things, is that it opened up the world of- open up people's worlds in a way that they weren't able to of like kind of what you're seeing with this town of like, as soon as they get this like more color in, (laughs) like literally they sort of like envelop it and they grow from it. And it would be interesting what this town would be like in a time when they would have access to more resources and more understanding of different kinds of people. Could they go the, the way you're talking about Ben, which is the dark, forum energy of the internet of course they could i'm sure some of them would especially that gang of boys and um and i think it it was nice to see a situation where everyone was so open to learning new things like even like the boy running Mm -hmm. the shop he gets that book and he's like i'm so excited to read it like that I, i can't remember what book it was but how they all are I think it shows a lot about the life the of Diane Vreeland. The life of yeah. Diane Vreeland, oh, yeah. if I remember correctly. Um, like but that. basically, which it makes me think of how in therapy as therapists, which we all are, like that unconditional positive regard. And when you kind of approach someone with like an open mind and kind of give them information, when they feel safe, which it seems like the people in this town mostly feel or like, because they're on their turf, um, people sometimes will open up and show you a lot more than you maybe thought they would be capable of on face value. Um, And I definitely have seen as a therapist, like someone I definitely could have like stereotyped in some way. And then as I kind of approach them unconditionally, you know, with unconditional positive regard and open up their minds more that people will sometimes very pleasantly surprise you Mm -hmm. and can really grow from that kind of consideration versus like thinking of them just in the very stereotyped negative light which is something i like about watching this movie it's very warm and fuzzy in that way mm-hmm. i don't know talking about their robes <laughs> um it, this is fringe okay this is this- fringe this is for me this is my outfit <laughs> <laughs> and she was right and it looked great on it her. Looked, it looked great on her. She was absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think this this town did do a good job of kind of letting them into their community in a way that um, was very '90s warm and fuzzy. That I don't think would happen in any way, shape, or form in reality. Mm-hmm. Like gaining access to a closed community like that, I doubt it. But the way that it happened in this film was definitely good to see and good to see people being willing to to challenge the old tired um resigned attitudes towards their lives that they had and mm-hmm. be willing to break out of old patterns i did think that that was that was a, a nice fantasy to see played mm-hmm. out well and probably <laughs> what makes this movie so beloved for this community as we talked about off mic is that there are a great many movies that are just about the trauma of any lifestyle like this. Like I remember like watching Boys Don't Cry when I was definitely too young to have watched that. And yeah. Seeing seeing that and like the trauma that goes along with that and how horrible, horrible, horrible Hillary Swank's character was treated. I was so long ago I don't remember the name, but to see just the the abuse, they just kind of alluded to it, but mm-hmm. kept showing the like the fairy tale rescue from it in this movie. The person's name was Brandon, I believe, but I can't remember the last name of the person that Hillary Swank was portraying in real in life. Boys Don't Cry? Yeah. Yeah. I, think it, yeah it's, I, I saw it when I was 14, so I don't remember now. It's been a long time since I saw it as well. 
Um, but no, and we were also talking off mic about how a maybe more dark, but probably more realistic presentation of this movie is Priscilla Queen of the Desert, which came out, I think a year before this movie, I was saying how in watching, I haven't seen Tu Wong Fu since I was pretty young or like younger. And so, um, I, in watching it now, I was like, ooh, like, is this a reaction to, like, other America's pop version of, like, um, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert? Because, like you're saying, Ben, in that movie, like, um, there is a lot of violence, there's a lot more violence, a lot more hesitancy. And also, I think what's interesting is that the characters aren't in drag during the day. Like, I think what is interesting about this movie, and I'm curious how realistic it feels to real life drag queens is that they're in drag 24 seven. Whereas um, from what I understand of like in Priscilla Queen of the Desert, also like real life drag queens that I follow, like Trixie Mattel and Katya and those kind of people, like they are not in drag all the time. Like they spend a good amount of their day-to-day life male presenting. Um, and so it is interesting that also in this movie, they're choosing to present as female all the time, which could have just been, I mean, I don't know why that choice is made by the writer or director. Um, but I think in Priscilla, they I don't know if they also make a choice to present his male more in that movie because they're trying to to be safer or because it's just it's more realistic to um, real life drag queen being. Were you looking it up then? The real name? No. Oh, OK, <laughs> I didn't think you know if you were. Mm-hmm. Um so is there anything else about sort of community within this movie as we see it within the drag community, within the found family or within the, the town? Nope. Okay. So no, we can move so. along to, well, we can go to like, we'll go down the road to the next topic, which is domestic inter intimate partner violence. Um, we wanted to talk about this subject because we haven't touched upon it specifically I don't know if we've ever talked about it as a topic in and of itself um, on this podcast, actually. I think we've alluded to it in different ways. Um, I think it's, it's happened. weaved in and out. Yeah, yeah. I think it's something that's more that's uh, weaved in and out. But a part of a part of what a part of the reason why I think it part of the reason why I wanted to talk about it a little bit is just because it's something that happens often in, Mm -hmm. in all different kinds of relationships. Like it, it isn't only in uh, heteronormative relationships that we see uh, domestic violence happen. So I'm just going to give some like kind of random um, statistics and then talk a little bit about what um, any perceived differences of what uh, intimate partner violence or domestic violence looks like in LGBTQ plus relationships. And before we do that, we will stop for a break. And also just in case anyone listens to our episodes about watching the movie, the reason we want to touch upon this is there's a character named Carol Ann played by Stalker Channing, who is in a um, domestic, who's experienced domestic violence at the hands of her husband, Virgil. It was a real piece of shit. All right. Correct it to assessment. You, Hannah. Okay. So when we talk about um, domestic and in- intimate partner violence, I'm just going to give you a definition of what that looks like. Um, so it's a pattern of behaviors used by one partner to maintain power or control over another partner in an intimate relationship. It often is based on a belief system that the perpetrator has the right to do harm and to control the victim. And uh, DV or IPV can take many forms, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, digital abuse, and spiritual abuse. Mm -hmm. Um, Domestic violence and intimate partner violence affects more more than 12 million people every year. It's more than 12 million people every year. One in nearly one in five women Uh, And about one in seven men report having experienced severe physical violence from an intimate partner in their lifetime. Um, About one in five female presenting people and one in 12 uh, male presenting have experienced sexual, have experienced contact sexual violence by an intimate partner. 
Um, the other things that I wanted to talk about, something that's kind of more updated, which is a myth about domestic violence is that abusive relationships have a predictable, re re repetitive pattern. And what they're saying is that it's more that it's systemic, it's power control, and there's pattern and it's purposeful, but not necessarily that as somebody who is in the relationship will be able to tell all the time where it's at, which is what I believe okay. that they're referring to. Here's some myths regarding intimate partner violence in the LGBTQ plus community. Beliefs that female presenting people are not violent. Uh, masculine presenting people are not commonly victims. That LGBTQ plus uh, intimate personal violence is mutual somehow, that there is no difference between heteronormative in intimate partner violence versus same gender intimate partner <laughs> violence. <laughs> um, it kind of is. So also that this IPV DV happens across everything. It's actually one of the only things that humans experience that cuts across. Um, it's something that is a part of almost every community that there is, um, whether that's a community we're looking at in terms of um, when we're going by um, skin color alone, when we're going by, um, I don't know, any other way that we like define humans. Any, dem any demographic that you think of, this is a part of their community. Um, that's how, that's a part of why it affects 12 million people. So this is the difference about, this is some of the, a couple of the points about how intimate partner violence impacts LGBTQ victims. Um, people who are transgender are more likely to experience intimate partner violence in public compared to those who do not identify as transgender, bisexual, Victims are more likely to experience sexual violence compared to people who do not identify as bisexual. Um, people of color, more specifically Black African American victims, are more likely to experience physical intimate partner violence compared to those who do not identify as um, Black or African American. LGBTQ white victims are more likely to experience sexual violence compared to those who do not identify as white. Um, and so just kind of and then this is just one more thing, and then I'll just kind of talk about it more vaguely. Types of uh, intimate partner violence in the LGBTQ plus community. 20% of victims have experienced some form of physical violence. 16% have been victims to threats and intimidation. 15% have been verbally harassed. 4% of survivors have experienced sexual violence. And 11% of intimate violent cases reported involved a weapon. The only reason why I kind of wanted to talk about it is because... This is something that isn't talked about um, or well, that we haven't really talked about, but also just kind of wanted to talk about it more in terms of giving some general information so that people can kind of be aware that this is something that that happens across the board and mm -hmm. that just because and that it doesn't matter what kind of relationship you are in, that this is something mm -hmm. that we that happens. And so yeah. um, go ahead, Brittany. I was just saying, I think that's interesting to point out because in this movie, I think we see it the way that it's more, most stereotypically thought of, which is between a heterosexual couple mm -hmm. where it's like a heterosexual man, heterosexual woman. Um, they are at what I assume is a lower socioeconomic status, um, part of a more like conservative seeming town. You know, I think this is sort of like almost like the parody of like someone who'd be going, doing domestic violence. And I think what's interesting in how they demonstrate it in this movie, which I think makes me think of what you're talking about and that there's not really a clear cycle, is that um, in sort of the smaller ways that Virgil is terrorizing um, Carol Ann, as you can see in the movie, like she is not, she doesn't go outside and like play and hang out with like everybody else. She's very isolated in her home. It seems like almost like an apartment like in the hotel, I think. And then also that even when she's experiencing small moments of joy, kind of what you're saying, sort of like the power dynamic isn't just as like, you did something I didn't like, so I'm going to smack you in the face. The way that you see it demonstrated with them is like in moments when she's experiencing any sort of joy, like she's doing dancing, very small, dancing to herself in the mirror. He immediately mm -hmm. is like, what are you doing? making fun of her, trying to get a rise out of her, trying to take away 
any sort of power she has because also joy identity that brings power, feeling good about things. So by keeping her down, it's also a way to keep someone well subjugated and keep them in a position uh, where you have power over them because he's not letting her experience even like a window of positivity that feels separate from him. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so- he creates a lot of terror. Um, as I say, he creates a lot of terror that she has to do everything perfectly in a way that's not possible. And you see that when Vita tries to put spice in the tomato sauce that they're making and that she's then trying to sift it out. Like, there's so many little things that they cover in the subtext of this movie that make it real clear that Carol Ann's life is miserable and that oh, Virgil yeah. is is tormenting her and that when he's confronted by Vita, he doesn't even care. He doesn't even deny it. He doesn't even defend himself. Just says some women need to be hit mm-hmm. and says nothing else about mm-hmm. it. Like, looks like mm-hmm. what you're going to do about it. Mm-hmm. So you see that he, this man is torturing her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and- absolutely. And yeah, like the spices thing, like that's a perfect scenario, which he could always be accusing her of fucking that up. And there's no way for her to prove that she didn't put spices in, like creating scenarios in which you, like you said, Ben, like she is set up to fail. Which is the way he wants it. And I think something that I want to touch on that Hannah, you covered well is because I see it a lot because I see a bunch of men. In my practice, I see you know a fair number of women too, but I see, based on the population I get, I probably get more men that are coming into therapy, and because I am a male therapist, than a lot of other yeah. people get. And the occurrence of domestic and intimate partner violence against men is so very much higher than ever gets reported. And the same types of behaviors that we see Virgil do are done in equally stereotypical ways uh, against men. And they be due to shame and guilt and the lack of standing and the homophobia concept I described in our episode on Brokeback Mountain, where that homophobia isn't the fear of gay men or it's the fear of other men and being rejected by them. Mm-hmm. That if you get beat up by a girl as a kid on the playground, your life is over forever. Mm -hmm. At least, especially in the 70s, 80s, 90s period where, you know, our characters would have grown up 60s through the 80s. And seeing seeing that so closely all the time um, in the work that I do, I think it's really important that we, we mention that and empower that men that are being abused do come forward and do something about it because they can be just as tortured as we see Carol Ann get tortured in this film by Virgil in other ways. And it is damaging. It does cause serious bouts with mental illness and even suicide. And I think it's really important that we come on to that, especially because it's been so thrust into our attention with the Depp versus Heard trial. And I'm not going to get into the the this or that of that because it's obvious that there is two-way abuse going on in that situation and tons of substance abuse. But looking at how present that this conversation has been, it's important that we recognize that it is real, that men and male presenting people get abused both physically and mentally too, and that they do deserve attention and not that the Depp heard thing is a, a benchmark for that and justice for Johnny can get fucked because that is a, a mess. But looking yeah. at the reality that there are other people who we do need to latch on to that aren't sitting in privileged spaces and can ridicule the process as they go through it, but people who are really being abused and tortured that do need and to feel empowered to come forward is important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. And I think one thing, two of the things that I wanted to to talk about um, or just bring up are some characteristics of perpetrators um, in intimate partner violence. Uh, just as, uh, you know, sometimes we just want to, a part of what we do is give mental health education and this is a part of that. So mm-hmm. here's some characteristics of perpetrators. So the people who are abusing other people. 
Some characteristics that they may have are low self-esteem, extreme jealousy, controlling attitude or possessiveness, believes in myths about abusive relationships. Often they can have a violent temper, extreme mood swings, inability to accept responsibility for their actions. Um, a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde personality, a sense of entitlement and feelings of inadequacy. And so when we talk about, you know, we talk about characteristics of what the abuser can have. I also want to talk about some of the things that are protective factors for people who are, who are being abused. So when we talk about protective factors, those are things that help kind of protect or have a, a kind of help protect the people who are in these situations. And oddly enough, as we were talking about in the beginning of the episode, it's all about um, community in a lot of different ways. So protective factors for people who experience um, intimate partner violence. Uh, they have high friendship quality. They have social support. And the community factors are that the neighborhood are collective, they have collective efficacy and the coordination of resources and services among community agencies, which we all know is one of the trickiest parts to getting anything done and helping the communities that we want to help is the coordination of resources and services and not denying access to anyone for any reason. Um, and so knowing that there are there are protective factors out there, there are lots of different um, lots of different agencies and communities that help with managing or helping you identify or getting the support that you might need um, in terms of if you're in this kind of uh, relationship or if you've experienced this kind of relationship, um, it's there's all different kinds of ways and we'll probably link them when we release the episode. To some of the places and uh, that you can contact if you need support in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and I think, kind of bridging on that, how we see in this movie is that, like we've already talked about before, this is a community that's been kind of cut off seemingly from the world. It's a very small, isolated, insulated community, and so it makes sense that in the pop popcorn ishness of this movie, it makes sense that. Um, Carol Ann doesn't feel the ability to break away from Virgil until a sense of community actually forms around her, specifically like Vita, but also Vita's incurred, like bringing in everybody else of kind of saying like this, we, this is not appropriate. We won't stand for this and we will support you if you take the very big risk of standing up to your abuser and mm -hmm. gives her sort of like the motivation and the, what's what I'm looking for? The inspiration to realize that like it could be different and you deserve for things to be different as well. Cause I think that's gonna feel hard about it too, especially because I'm gonna assume that the whole town kind of knows what's going on already and hasn't yeah. done anything about it. Um, and so that also one increases the isolation that the abuser, the abused person feels. And then also normalizes and cr helps that narrative of like, well, this must be just how things are sometimes. And like no one in the town is having an uproar about it. So it must be like not okay, but it's just the way things are. And so I think yeah. having something come in, which is, which is the community part of it, which is having community kind of one supports you in a literal sense, also supports you in an emotional sense and also let you know like this is not okay. And if you and if you leave, we will help you. And I think that's the big part of what you're saying, Hannah, when people do, you know, leave abusive relationships, um, a lot of times they ha they sometimes have to resort to, you know, community resources. You know, sometimes even having to go mm -hmm. to like group homes, shelters, situations like that. Um, I think it's like called Sarah's house in Chicago. I hope I'm remembering that right. It has been a while since I've had to look into it, but there's one like that in Chicago that, you know, um, I think mothers and children can go to wives and children can go to, um, to stay at, um, if they are fleeing abuse. Um, but yeah, like you do need that community sometimes to get up and get out. Yeah, Sarah's circle. Sarah Circle, okay. Ooh, I'm is, so surprised I remember that. 
yeah, uh, that is quite nearby to me and mm-hmm. you. <laughs> mm-hmm. In our neighborhoods in Chicago. Right. So anything. Which is sarahs-circle.org for those mm-hmm. of you who might need that. Yeah. Who might be local to us. All right. So anything else you want to speak on before we go into treatment? All right. No, we'll I take a break so. here. All right, treatment. Who would like to go first? Anybody? Anybody? I think Brittany wants to go first. Ugh, fine. Okay. So thinking about it, I was thinking who I would think I would like to work with is Chi Chi because Chi Chi reminds me of a lot of kids I've worked with over the years who have, um, you know, not been taken care of or have gone from like house to household or like been kind of floating around waiting for someone to take care of them. But once they get someone to take care of them, they have a hard time settling into that care. And so I think, I think Chi Chi would do well with something called dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT, which is kind of, I always talk about it like the sophisticated cousin of CBT where it's a lot more, um, it's a lot more structured. It's a lot more involved. It's a lot more, it's like CBT cognitive behavioral therapy is very skills-based. DBT is as well, but there's also a lot of focus on not just regulating yourself, but also how do you communicate with others? A lot of it, like there's two kind of big tenets of it. One is emotion regulation or distress tolerance is how it's called. The other sort of big tenet is interpersonal effectiveness. And so I think as we see with Chi Chi, Uh, I think she needs a lot of support with figuring out how to use skills to manage mood dysregulation (laughs) is like mood dysregulation is the fancy therapist way of like saying kind of having like a mood swing or kind of, you know, having a big moment we call you're having a hard time regulating or you're being really dysregulated in that moment. That's how we to be type it into our notes. Um, But basically it is teaching skills to empower people to, no matter what's going on, that you can still use, when I say grounding techniques like deep breaths, things, we've talked about those a lot here, but ways mm-hmm. to kind of regulate both your body and also your mind when you're feeling, when you're feeling really overwhelmed, dysregulated, however you want to think of it. And then once you kind of get more regulated, then you learn that after you regulate, you can then start using some very specific techniques to help communicate your needs to others. I think that with Chi Chi, like anybody, she's someone that has a lot of needs. And I think as we see in the movie, she tries to get those needs met in ways that aren't helpful or in ways that allow people to misconstrue her. When I work with teenagers um, and I would go over this with them, a lot of the ways that I would put it is, I get that you're upset. I get that you're angry. I get that you have a lot within you and that you have needs. And those are all really valid. And that being angry, being whatever, and letting people know, I get it. And my concern for you, this is my little spiel, is that the way that you're going about trying to get those needs met allows people to very intensely misunderstand you and write you off as either an asshole, a punk ass kid, I think with Chi Chi also like mouthy or maybe like over sexualized, you know, like there's a lot of ways that she comes off in the world. Like the way she dresses, the way she acts, like in that pie con, like when they're eating the pie, she's like licking it as she's crawling on the table. I'm like, Chi Chi girl. And so what things like dear man, which is a very specific skill that you could look up if you're interested in DBT, and Which Brittany other, loves to quote because it is so valuable and you should listen mm-hmm. up when she does it. Yes, is that it teaches you specifically how to articulate what's going on for you. So I could do a little, my little spiel on dear woman. It's dear man, but the way that I learned it also added the W-O onto it for dear woman. It's a long acronym. So basically the dear part is what I focus on with people, which is a literal template of how you can sort out what's going on with you. So D is describe the situation. What are the details of what's going on? E is express the emotion that you are feeling because of the situation. Not, I feel like you're being a massive jerk. Like the emotion, I feel scared. I feel nervous. I feel upset, whatever. And then A is ask for what you need. Specifically, what is going on? Be concrete and specific. And then Um, The R is reward the listener, either by saying thank you for listening, or this is how my request would also benefit you. 
So an example could be, I'm trying to think of one from the movie on the fly, but maybe when she jumps out of the car, I can't remember why she does it, but I'll make up one of like, the example could, it could be like, hey, you know, the other day when we argued about, I don't know, the car, I felt really frustrated um, that I couldn't finish my sentence. And the ask would be in the future, I would really appreciate it if you let me have a, like finish my thought before you also added your thought. That would really help me have a communicate more effectively and not argue myself. So that would be, that's a very like straightforward way to do a deer, but you can, if you look it up, you can look it over. Um, there's a lot of explainers for how to do it. But I think with, Chi it would be a lot of maybe walking her through these situations where and helping her identify like what need are you trying to get met by acting out, by throwing a fit, by walking away from the car, by, by, you know, trying to get that guy's attention. Like, and is that truly what you're looking for or is it something else? And how are you articulating that need to others so that you get the most respect and actually get that need met? And people don't misunderstand you. So to me, it's a lot about empowerment, though I can understand at first glance when I teach it to people, it can feel a lot like um, I have to keep my cool and I have to let people walk all over me and I have to be respectful even when people are treating me like X, Y, Z. So I understand that I can feel a lot like you're not standing in your power when you start learning like distress tolerance and, and interpersonal effectiveness. And what I try to teach people is that hope one you have to get over that but two it's like this is actually you demonstrating power because you are not letting someone else dictate the way that you behave and react and you're also more you can also leave situations feeling proud of yourself like you asserted yourself even if the other person doesn't respond in the way that you want um so I think she could benefit from some DBT on top of, I'm sure like we don't know a lot about her backstory, but I would assume there might be like trauma work she'd have to do before she could do DBT. Like we don't know her whole story, but I think that could be really effective for her on top of whatever else she might need in, in her specific community and with her very specific like experiences. So I'll leave it with that. Um, Hannah or Ben. I think the person I would most want to talk to is actually, um, oh, what's the Snipes character's name just left my head Noxima. when I wanted to talk about Noxima. I would want to talk to Noxima because the amount of implied situations, like you were talking about, Brittany, like picking up on with some of the little behaviors in Chi Chi that you saw about holding forks and things like that, that I think the number of situations where I saw Noxima allude to having gone through things and the amount of bad experiences that they were trying to protect Chi Chi yeah. from having implied that she had been through quite a bit herself and had to learn the hard way and that there was a reason that she liked to be so fit. Mm. And okay. I think that uncovering that and helping her work through that because I think Vita was allowed to do some things that Noxima could not. And seeing Noxima be so protectionist and isolationist about whether to intervene with things and the fear that, that comes with that is appropriate for her because, you know, like Vita storming in and punching a white man in the face was not something that was going to go well for Noxima. And mm. she knew that. And she talked about it and she was aware that like we are drag queens. I am black. This is going to go bad. I cannot do this. We cannot do this. They're going to hate us when they figure out what we really are. This is going to go bad was constantly a warning given by this character in a number of different ways. And even though it is Vita we see who gets abused and messed with and like when this person like lifted up Kurt Russell and just threw him on a car, I was like, really? Mm -hmm. Like this, this little dude just chucked a 200 pound man up there. Okay. I don't buy that, but okay. Um, looking at that, like we know that Noxima has had several experiences that plus rejection and, and anger and confusion, like that gets much worse as Hannah pointed out from the statistics. 
mm-hmm. or her demograph. And I think that there's a lot of her story that doesn't get told in this movie because it stays in the um, 90s pleasantry that, mm-hmm. you know, kind of just alluded to stuff where they, they give warnings and the uh, allu- alluded to potential gang rape scenes and things that happen or violence. I'm not sure really what their objective was, but it wasn't good when those good old mm-hmm. boys surround um, Chi Chi by the grain silos. But I think Noxima would be a person who would really benefit from building a trusting relationship with a therapist to open up and go through her history and look for the points that still hurt and stay active. And I think I'm not sure. I don't know enough about her history or about her personality to know which particular direction I would want to go, which therapeutic technique. But I think the float back technique from EMDR would be among a the fantastic starting point to go for where you essentially look for behaviors like she's exhibiting where someone is showing like a constant rubbed raw kind of mentality against a certain type of thing or a constant on guard display that doesn't seem like it matches the situation that's presenting itself but there is clearly something underneath that she has been through that is making her more on guard than everybody else and i think for me working with that the float back technique involves like identifying what's the image that you saw that represents the worst part what's the body feeling what's the thought about yourself and what's the what are the emotions And when you identify those four things, you're exploring four different layers of memory encoding, some of which are nonverbal. And when people have been through traumatic experiences, being able to identify where the nonverbal components of trauma are, where the felt sense of fear and terror live in the body is a critical component to helping people tie together and plug up the puzzle piece holes that don't complete their story, but you can tell they're reacting to things that they may or may not understand why. I think she understands full well why, but whether or not she'd be willing to talk about them already to is a different discussion. But I think for me, helping her tie together why she reacts the way that she does and how to recognize when that level of being on guard is appropriate, which frankly in this community I would say was, but the ability to recognize when that kicks on, even when she doesn't need it, which we saw some of in some other situations. So I think that would be my direction of going would be helping to explore the history, the traumatic events that make up her identity and sense of safety and see if there aren't some things that could use some repair. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really know uh, who I would who I would choose. I think the first person that comes to my mind is Carol Ann. Uh Someone who has newly left a relationship. One of the other statistics or whatever that I didn't say um, is that it can take up to seven times, Mm. seven breakups before a person who is in a domestic violent or intimate partner violence relationship to be able to leave. And a lot Uh of that has to do with all of the, um, gaslighting and emotional abuse and controlling um, and possessiveness that happens in those kinds of relationships. Um, And so um, people who come out of relationships like that often um, need a lot of definitely the, the positive regard that Brittany was talking about earlier um, in the episode, but also someone who can help them learn well, A, I'm not going to talk about that. Mostly just having <laughs> someone who is in their corner and who is very clearly in their corner and helps remind them of the ways in which they are human and the natural expectation of experiencing symptoms of um, post-traumatic stress disorder that might occur or because also, yes, it's great that Virgil just drives off, but in real life, I don't know what that would look like. We might be looking at, you know, he might fight for custody of their children. He might have financial, you know, like there's so many different ways that this could go, but that like having house someone- under his name or her name, sorry. Exactly, exactly. Like there's, there's just a lot of parts to that. And that's where the financial abuse um, comes in um, as something that has newly been recognized by, I think, a federal law that finally accepted financial abuse and um, 
technology abuse as two other ways that domestic violence on intimate partner relationships, that two different other ways that that happens on a pretty regular basis. Um, and it's actually always been happening. It just hasn't been recognized as clearly as it is now. But that a part of a part of working with people who have, you know, as a marriage and family therapist, I sometimes assess couples who there is domestic violence and a part of assessing those couples often ends up being having to have a chat with one of the partners, the one who's experiencing the abuse um, Mm -hmm. as, you know, supporting them and saying, look, like I, you know, this is what we can do together and I can't see you all together. Because a part of um, doing assessment for couples, which I've definitely talked about a billion times, is <laughs> that if there is active domestic violence or even a history of domestic domestic violence or intimate partner violence, that the person who is the abuser has to be treated for that at first before we can do anything else, which as we, you know, which is not something that's going to maybe naturally happen. And also depending on where I'm finding the client. And in this experience, Carol Ann has been not only fully supported by her community, everyone is aware of what is going on and is clearly supporting her in the situation that there it's going to be you know there's going to be some hard days there's going to be some confusion there's going to be it's going to be hard to trust herself hard to repair parts of her identity of who she is and what she expected from a relationship um and also as a mother in terms of you know what does that look like for her then being a single parent even though i suspect she was a single parent when she was uh, married as well that that have all different kinds of complications and nuances. And also there's a lot of, there's just a lot of guilt and shame that is associated with being in in a relationship like this. Um, Especially if there's children who are a part of that or who end up being a part of that, or even just have to experience it, have to experience watching that happen. So I think that would be the person that I would pick um, and that a lot of it would be encouragement to come in Um, to make sure to help her be aware that one hour a week is the literal least that we could be doing to help her find her new place. But also there's a lot of There's a lot of being in their corner. There's a lot of positive regard, a lot of reminding of what are the emotional rights as a human that she is allowed to have. Because when you are in a relationship like this, a lot of those pieces are taken away. Okay. That's great. So we will slip into final thoughts. Um, I'll go, I can go first. I also wanted to note that when we were deciding upon what movies to talk about with this movie, I, I love this movie when it first came out, like I was saying, like I was like nine when it came out. And so this was very much like a blockbuster movie that I would got that was just like fun, warm, fuzzy, cozy, like 90s movie. And when we were deciding it, I was like, oh God, I hope it wasn't horrible because it's the 90s and three, you know, cishet men who were playing mm-hmm. these characters. So I did do some Googling. And so I just wanted to shout out the three articles that I looked at. One is by Danielle Villarreal um, from thehornet.com called 10 Things I Loved and Hated About Tu Wong Fu. Um, one is about from out.com by um, Les Fabian Brant Brathwaite. And then one was from decider.com. Know your history <laughs> giving to, to Wong Fu. Thanks for everything, Julia, Julie Newmar. It's due um, by Joe Reed. They were all written by gay men. And basically they were saying kind of the extent to what we've been talking about, which is that this movie like halfway does a great job and that the representation, they really like the movie is written by a gay man, directed by a woman. They like um, worked with real drag queens in the scene and like a lot of the, almost, I think all the drag performers in the beginning and opening, like the ending and the first and last scene were all real drag performers. And basically what they were saying, which is very nineties is that it's a, it's not an over the top cartoon representation of drag queens, gay men, which is good. And that it makes a point of shitting on homophobia, all the kind of things like with that cop and stuff like that. Like they make it very clear, like that that is the cowardly way to behave and not cool. And the main critique that all the, 
that each article talks about, which we've touched upon a little bit, but I just want to clarify is that one, it doesn't really demonstrate a truly realistic, a lot of them were saying how it's a less brave version of Priscilla Queen of the Desert and that it skirts away from like the true violence and, and terror that would happen that these like that town of like that group of boys just turns it around overnight and is really respectful to them by the next day um, that nothing really bad happens to them really, really bad. I mean, that still is the sexual assault scene. So I don't want to ignore that. And um, that they are quote unquote portrayed as like what they say, gange, gauge, gangels, like J-A-Y-N-G-E-L-S, which is the idea that these non-sexual gay men come into a community and just like kind of like magically fairy like godmother them while they Mm -hmm. don't really have other than chi chi like the other two characters you don't really see them as gay men you don't see them as gay sexual men it's all very clouded under more like heteronormative stuff but the fact that they stay in drag all the time is also unrealistic so i just want to clarify that even though it is a movie that i love and that i hold a lot of nostalgic love for i just wanted to make sure that we noted that in the community, it seems like it's also very beloved, but also they kind of look at it with a little bit of a side eye, like it's a good movie and it could have done more to be more representative. And I think the, that's the complaint a lot with um, like, especially like gay male characters like Jack from Will and Grace is like a lot of times they're kind of shown in a sexless way because we're still mm-hmm. like gross, icky, like two men kissing, like they don't really allow them to be like fully realized sexual beings because we couldn't handle it. It's very much, I think this movie, though I love it, feels very much like a gay movie made for straight people. (laughs) And so it skirts a lot of the things that would make straight people uncomfortable um, while still trying to represent diversity. So that's my final thoughts. Okay. Hannah, you want to go next to me? Um, I'll go next. That's fine. Um, so I enjoyed this movie. It's only the second time I've seen it. I didn't see it until I was a um, a grown up, uh, mostly because <laughs> I grew partially grew up in a town that was very similar to the town we see in this film. Um, and so that wasn't something that anyone was talking about or that I had any awareness of at that time. Um, but this is the second time that I've watched it. And I do... I do enjoy parts of it. I think some of the harder parts are the racism, especially mostly. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, mostly put towards Chi Chi um, mm-hmm. uh, in a lot of different contexts. I mean, they're also, they're all profiled in one way or another in this film. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, but I think one of the parts that happened repeatedly and that was uncomfortable was all of the different things that were said about Chi Chi um, in, in all different kinds of ways. So that makes it, you know, cringy and uncomfortable. Um, and also being a person who has been called those names by those same kind of people, uh, in my own experience does not help. So, yeah. uh, but that overall, I, you know, there is a warm fuzziness to it and I did enjoy that. I'm sure that I'll watch it. I, I, I might watch it again, maybe. I don't know. It's kind of on the fence for me. The, the, racial, um, the racial stuff is, is tricky um, yeah. since it's an experience that I've had. Um, but, but other than that, like it was, I enjoyed watching it as a therapist as well, which doesn't often happen. So I'm not sure if I would watch it again, um, but I did enjoy it. And I'm glad that we got a chance to talk about it. All right. I guess that leaves me. Um, So I'm going to start off with saying my piece about the actors first, because I think the acting that was done in this movie was phenomenal. And that, in particular, John Leguizamo is an unheralded actor who is such a fantastic character actor and the way that he truly loses himself and into roles and becomes exactly what the movie needs is something that he brings to every performance I've ever seen him do ever. And I think that this is an unheralded performance for him where he really transforms himself and he's great. We give too much of that credit to some other people that also are deserving of it, but we don't recognize him and especially what his character had to endure, which means he had to endure hearing all of that racist stuff too. Yeah. We hear Hannah saying like, mm-hmm. Ugh, like he had to live that as mm-hmm. that character. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that all, all three of these actors did a great job um, where they were in their careers. Like we see 
Wesley Snipes and um, Patrick Swayze had a lot more clout and a lot more ability to take these risks than John Leguizamo did at this time because he's usually a character actor playing some kind of character part. Uh-huh. Uh, to see them them take a, a risk on like this, uh, even though it stayed in the milk toast range, was I think important and it was a big statement for them to make in their careers, particularly as both of them had been making movies like Roadhouse and Demolition Man right around this time. And uh-huh, then uh-huh. Wesley Snipes soon after went on and probably started Blade, uh-huh. which was the, the among the first Marvel movies to like really start the superhero movement and do uh-huh. so in the dark way that it did. Um, but I have the same criticisms uh, of the movie that Brittany mentioned. Like, I really think that it stayed too fluffy. It stayed too light. It did didn't ever expose our characters to a whole lot of true risk and danger. When I mean, we have the, the scene with the officer, which was um, horrifying. And I'm sure that experiences like that have happened for a lot of people from any number of men in positions of power. That is something that needs to be checked and to see that experience play it out in kind of a light fluffy way. I didn't care for, but I also appreciate why having it play out the way it did was probably the tone of the movie. It's the tone of the movie. It's the tone of the mid nineties. It's also, you know, not every movie has to be about the worst version of the story possible all the time. And so many of those movies are that way that having something that when you're not in the mood to be reminded of the worst moment of your life, this movie allows you to kind of play it out in a fantasy way. We're like, Oh, this person grabbed you in learning something about you. You did not invite them to know. And then gets shamed immediately and uh, humiliated for it. And despite that, that was homophobic in itself, seeing that as a fantasy that a lot of people that have been victimized, I'm sure have of like, fuck this guy. He's going to get his from his people when he gets embarrassed for being an asshole. Cause and he loses he, in like every way that you can lose. Right. This fight. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I appreciate that, but I found this, the, the movie itself, the pacing was kind of slow and it, I struggled to keep my attention with it. Like I appreciated the character journey that happened and the way that the actors delved into it, but I found the movie to be slow and kind of boring pace wise. I did thoroughly enjoy the Robin cameo. And every time that we <laughs> do any movie that has Robin Williams in it, I will remind you all that I love that man. And he is the defining actor of my childhood, I think. And I think uh, fond thoughts of him every time he comes on a screen, because that man could transform any role too. But he was also just always Robin. Mm-hmm. And it was always the right thing, the right dose of Robin for the movie. <laughs> I will say, Ben, to what you said, I think John, when I was doing research, I think John Leguizamo and Patrick Swayze got nominated for Golden Globes for this movie. Um, I think, unfortunately, Wesley Snipes was the only one it didn't, even though I loved him. He was my favorite, I think, of the three. He just made me laugh mm-hmm. a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I And think... I loved his relationship with Clara. Is that her name? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The old mm-hmm. woman. If I were to be giving out Golden Globes, it would be John Leguizamo first and then uh, Wesley Snipes second and Patrick Swayze third. I found Patrick Swayze to be the least convincing of the three. Um, but also, like, the, the man's chin is, like, so chiseled out. And not that I found his Vita the least convincing, but I found Patrick Swayze's acting to be the least convincing of the three. Uh, be, be clear on that. Like, not, not yeah. how they presented, but uh, the acting that Patrick Swayze did great, but the other two were so good. Mm-hmm. They were all really yeah. good. And I will say too, and we didn't mention this. So if anyone listening wanted us to mention this, we didn't. I'll just throw it out there. It is interesting that Vita dresses just like her mother. And they were wearing mm-hmm. almost the same outfit in the scene where her mom comes out and sees her and then goes back in. They're almost wearing the exact same outfit. A yellow sort of like church-esque cream woman suit. It's cream. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah, and that she always dresses kind of like the sort of like hoity toity, like waspy energy that I assume her community, like where she grew up in, like how they right. dressed. So, very prim right. and proper lady. And I'm like, hmm, Freud would eat that up. Yeah, a statement hat was not a thing either of the other two were going to come up with. But mm-hmm. yeah, I think for, for me, I just think this movie, it was a little, it was a little slow. It didn't take enough risk. I thought that it had like a 40% rating on, um, on Rotten Tomatoes from the, the critics. A 71. And about a, right. A 71 from, 
from the fans. And I think I fall somewhere in between where I'd maybe give it like a 58. Um, it, it was very good and it, it kept his message. But for me, it just couldn't hold my attention in the way it's that I would have wanted it to. The story didn't drive enough. It wasn't funny enough. It wasn't heartwarming enough. It kind of danced along all of those lines and kept it as like almost TV movie energy to me. And it's funny with you saying that as I was literally thinking it's one of those movies that if it's like Sunday at like 2 PM and I turn on TBS and it's like 20 minutes in or just started, I'll be like, okay, I can watch this for the next two hours while I'm laying on the couch. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a really spot on assessment <laughs> of it because that's exactly the way I feel about it. And I remember Two, seeing it at our local video store, the uh, the family owned uh, owned one. Not when Family Video moved in or before Blockbuster took a giant shit. Was video <laughs> events in uh, that must have been Richmond Park. Um, but looking at the cardboard cutout for this movie, it was up right when you walked in the video store. It was there every time I would see it. And this is the first time I think I've actually sat and watched the whole movie. I've seen bits and pieces. But this is the first time I think I watched the whole movie and I had high hopes for it. And I thought like, oh, yeah, this is like one of those forgotten 90s gems that I just missed because it hit me kind of at the wrong developmental time. And it just didn't deliver in a way that I loved. I think I feel very meh about it overall. I appreciate what it was trying to do and the constraints of the time of what, 95 when this came out. So yeah. this that was a different world than exists now. And I mm -hmm. also appreciate that. So I don't want my criticism to be too harsh but it didn't deliver on the ways that I would have expected being um, in the, you know, early 2020s now. Mm -hmm. But I do think it was well done. It was well shot. The acting was good. Stockard Channing's transformation into that red dress at the end was glorious. And watching mm -hmm. her take that stand um, was, was awesome. And her playing a character that had to find strength instead of coming out guns blazing, like she does every other scene I've, or movie I've seen her in was great, but Overall, I felt kind of mad about it. And uh, in Hannah's words, I probably won't seek this out. <laughs> um, okay. But I, I did enjoy that we had a, you know, a, a Batman reference right off the bat. And also, speaking of Patrick Swayze's chin, how was that man not Batman? Like, you want to look at somebody that has the chin for it. Not Patrick tall Swayze enough. had it. He's, he is, he's tall. He's, in, he's 5'10", or was 5'10". But that is one inch taller, one inch taller than Michael Keaton. Mm, I love that you know how tall all of the Batmans and Batman potentials were. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, well, well, I think because of you two and your criticism of people's height all the time, like I that, do not. Don't lump me into Hannah, that. Hannah, it's Hannah. It's Hannah. Mm -hmm. that, <laughs> yeah, that fucking neither, right. ne She's neither, proud of it. neither Alden Ehrenreich or um, Donald Glover were tall enough to be Han and Lando. <laughs> Don't start on this. All right. With that, on that <laughs> note, we will wrap it up. Um, so as we always say, you can find us at Instagram, Facebook at Popcorn Psychology, TikTok at Popcorn Psychology, Twitter at Popcorn underscore Psych. You can always email us at popcornpsychology at gmail.com if you have any suggestions, feedback, movies you'd like us to talk about. We're always receptive if you email us on there. Um, you also can become a patron of ours. Um, and if you give us $50 or more, you can choose an episode that we talk about, a movie. And then we also have merch at tpublic.com, um, as well as, I think I'm missing something. I can't recall. Oh, leave us a review. Leave us a review, if you will, at Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen. We really appreciate it. And once again, happy Pride. And, and we don't will be a douche. Talk to you all later. <laughs> Jesus, you too.